Elevation Nation. When Parker and I first started the podcast, we had a list. And on this list were some people we looked up to from afar who had no idea who we were, who were also tackling problems that people had in their 20s. And their stories and their missions resonated with us. And to say we are excited to have our guest on tonight would be an understatement because Alana was on our list. She was one of the folks that we really wanted to meet, to talk to, to learn from because her story is so similar to ours. Alana Dunn is on the podcast. She's the host of Seeing Other People, now screening for Love, a new show on Snapchat, and is just expanding her empire, helping people with their dating advice, specifically in their 20s, because that's where we're at right now. Alana, we are so excited to, that you are on Elevation Nation with us. Thank you for hanging out with us for a bit. Thank you for having me. I mean, I just need to say next time I'm having a bad day, I'm going to call you because that was like the Please. best introduction. I feel really good about myself right now. Like that was Yeah, great. well, Alana, I will say he may give it to you the first time, but I've done it so many times talking with Sam. He doesn't, you know, do it often. So maybe I need to ask him to be nicer and tell me <laughs> how great I am here and there. But Alana, I am pumped. Sam is pumped. You know, it's funny when I go on Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat, your face just comes all over. Maybe it's just because I just follow you, but your content is awesome. What you're talking about is super relevant for young adults, and that's why we're going to have an awesome conversation today. But first, it is Elevation Nation, so you got to give an elevator pitch. Who are you, Alana? Oh my God, I've never been good at the elevator pitch. And that's something, you know, we all know that we need to have one. And I've tried so many times to perfect it, but I will give it a go. And you can give me a rating out of 10 if you want. Oh, we will give you a rating for sure. <laughs> yeah, but um, I'm Alana Dunn. I am 27 years old. I live in New York City. And as Sam mentioned, I host the podcast called Seeing Other People. And it's really all about helping people feel less alone and more empowered in their dating lives. Dating is one of the hardest things that we have to go through in our 20s, and there's no guidebook for it. We're not taught how to communicate. We're not taught how to meet somebody on a dating app and not ghost each other and develop a real connection with someone. And a lot of the things we experience in our dating lives can feel really isolating, and we often feel like we're the only person feeling these things and going through these things, but that's not true. So I really try and shine a light on people's experiences and also talk to expert guests who can help us actually learn from it. So that is what I do. That's a great elevator pitch. You know, yeah. I was going to say, you yeah, didn't practice like 20s, at all. 20 story building, you know, boom, Let's right go. there. It was like good, like 45 seconds. I'd That's say. how Parker oh and I measure elevator pitches. Like how many floors the elevator was of the building. I We've like had like a 300 Ooh. floor elevator before. <laughs> Oh my building. God. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah. I used to talk so much and I could go on and on about it for a very long time, though. I guess that is what we will do in this exactly. little episode. But um, I try to kind of catch myself and cut it off when it needs to be cut off. No, that was absolutely perfect. And we're really excited to dive into obviously what you're doing with your brand, the podcast, the Snapchat show and dating as a whole. But I first want to give you the opportunity to talk a little bit more about yourself. I know your listeners know you, uh, your dating life, right? Everything that's going on in your world. But you're also an incredible entrepreneur, right? And you're someone who is starting a brand really from scratch. So I want to give you the opportunity to talk a little bit about that. Take me into the life of young childhood Alana. Like, What was your dream growing up? Did you always want to be a personality or a host or an entrepreneur? I wanted to be a pop star, but I sound I mean, like you are holding the mic when I sing. I am like holding that, the mic. Alana. It's something that, it, that truly was my dream, to like be holding a mic, um, though preferably on a stage where I was singing. Obviously, that didn't happen. <laughs> I learned very quickly that was not going to happen. My voice lessons didn't go well, even though my mom likes to say that I was incredible and had like the voice of an angel. I'm like, no, mom, I did not. Um, but no, I, I was super outgoing. I really didn't care what people thought of me. Um, even though I, I remember like in middle school, like 
and stuff. I definitely was not cool by any means. Like people did not think highly of me, but I definitely always kind of went to the beat of my own drum and I let myself really be so passionate about the things that I was passionate about. And, and at the time that was anything from like the Jonas brothers to wearing like really bright colored clothing to making like weird music videos of myself. And like, I was, I spent most of like middle school and high school on iMovie finding these random bands and entering all these contests where I was just making music videos and, or taking their footage and editing it down. And it's really funny how that ended up turning into kind of like what I did for a living uh, for a bit. It's what I ended up studying in college. I went to Syracuse. I studied television, radio, film, and my classes, my, instead of having tests and papers, it was like record this, film this music video, write this hmm. script. And um, so that definitely translated into what I do now, which is super cool. It's so cool. I love hearing people's story, like how, you know, childhood translates into, like you said, your dream. I mean, you're not singing in front of a crowd, but, you know, if we're talking, I don't know, metaphorically speaking, you know, you have a mic, you are talking the in mic. front of an audience. So it's pretty close yeah. to being a pop star and you're only, let's say, elevating uh, to the next level. So Alana, I'm curious, like you graduate college, you know, you got this awesome degree. I'm assuming new house, very mm -hmm. well-known degree, uh, in the communication and journalism world. What was the next step for you? So my heart was in music. Um, I mentioned the Jonas brothers before, like it was a huge part of my childhood, like shaping who I was. I had so many friends because of my love for music, specifically the Jonas Brothers um, concerts were like what I lived for. And I wanted to work in the music industry. I did throughout all of college. I tried to get my foot in every single door that I could. And I did. And I never imagined that I would ever want to leave the industry. But after a few years, so I interned right out of college, just getting a job in music was is incredibly difficult. There are so few jobs and it's so competitive. You interned um, out of college. Yeah. Okay. So I, you couldn't, graduated. I couldn't get a job. Graduated. You're like, hey, I work for free. Had the best resume out of anybody that I had known. Like Z100, Kiss FM, MTV, Capitol Records, Billboard, like couldn't get a job. Wow. That's and, tough. That, yeah. Let's talk for just a quick second, not to for hijack sure. your story, but that's like really hard, especially as a young kid, right? Like graduating college, all your friends are getting jobs around you. It's like, to, I mean, you can't help but compare yourself to them. How, how did you deal with that? I mean, that's really it's hard. Deflating. It's so yeah. deflating, I feel like. It was really hard. And yeah. it was also hard knowing that I like... I literally had done everything. I made every sure. single connection I could make. I did every job. Like my resume could not have been better. And it was just like, why can everybody else get a job except for me? And like, I'm willing to literally, like, I know I'm going to be making no money, basically minimum wage. And I mean, all of senior year, I was just seeing my friends like interview like nine months in advance for jobs and getting these offers with salaries that were going to be like quadruple what I knew I was probably going to end up making. And when it came down to it and I, I graduated and I couldn't get a job, I was just like, I don't get, like, I don't get it because where did I go wrong? But I know that I didn't do anything wrong. And I know I just have to keep reminding myself that this is the industry and it doesn't mean I'm not good enough. And it doesn't mean I didn't do enough. It just is what it is. And so it was a lot of reminding myself, like you are doing the right things. It just takes time. And that is interesting because that's something that I like, really have to remind people of when it comes to dating too. Like you're not necessarily doing say, something wrong. Yeah. It it's, just, it's hard. We compare ourselves yeah. always to always. other people and it's not necessarily a fair comparison or a level playing field. So I love that you kind of had to just keep reminding yourself. I don't know if you're one of the people that like look in the mirror and actually tell yourself things. Maybe that's just me because I'm insane. But like those reminders, I think, are really important to help keep you sane and knowing that you're moving in the right direction. Otherwise, it can feel like you're kind of stuck in quicksand. Yeah, without a doubt. So yeah, I finally ended up getting a job uh, the fall after graduation. So I, I interned for the summer, finally started a job in September of 2016 and that was at Sony Music and I thought it was a dream job and I think every single one of my internships 
and then leading into this job kind of confirmed for me that there really is no such thing as a dream job. And what matters the most is the people you're working with and if what you're actually doing fulfills you. And that was a really hard pill to swallow. And I, after about six months, kind of stopped drinking the Kool-Aid, the rose-colored glasses faded out, and I realized I was not doing what I wanted to be doing. I wasn't feeling fulfilled, and I was really unhappy. And I stayed there for two years, and by... By maybe a year and a half in, I hated music. I stopped Mm. listening to music. I stopped checking New Music Friday. I was like, this is bad. I hate everything about this industry, and I'm not okay, and I need to get out. Was it because you just had this bad experience? Was there a particular experience that you had that was like, all right, this is it. I'm done with this? Or was it just like you coming to that realization? Like, damn. It was wow, a this is not what I wanted. I thought it was going to yeah. be. It was a combination of things. One part of it was, I mean, seeing my coworkers who were three, four, five, eight, nine, ten years older than me having the same struggles that I was having, where I felt like I kept having all these amazing ideas and I would bring them to the head of my team and they'd be like, oh, that's great, but it's just never going to happen. And I basically was told, like, you can't have ideas. You're not allowed to have ideas. Your ideas are never going to be seen through. And there was a lot of realizing that like so few people in the industry actually end up succeeding, end up not having to live paycheck to paycheck. I mean, I was sitting there at 21 years old, listening to my 28 year old coworkers saying that they have no money and that they need to move to a cheaper apartment and that they literally are still living paycheck to paycheck. And I'm like, I don't want that to be me. And they they had high up positions. Um, And another part of it was I, at the time, was dating people who basically like only worked in music and it every single time those situations like crashed and burned and I just it 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 was basically like my work life was not working out I went and took on side jobs where I was like managing in bands and stuff and those ended up like not working out because I ended up like there ended up being kind of romantic situations happening and we can get into that um, ended up all kind of being all encompassing of like music industry equals bad for Alana. And that was really hard. Cause I was so sure that I knew what I wanted to do. And I realized I didn't, it was a really rude awakening for me. And then when I tried to apply to jobs, I didn't know what to do. Cause I had only ever really known the music industry and I ended up getting really lucky and and finding this job at Hinge that was, the title was Video and Content Producer. And it was pretty much using most of the skills that I had that I was using in music, but in dating. And I was always the friend that my other friends would come to to talk about their dating problems, not necessarily because they had the best advice, but because I was really interested and wanted to listen. Mm. And a huge other part of that role was being an on-camera personality and uh, essentially being the face of Hinge online. And had I been on camera before, maybe two or three times, was I good at it? Absolutely not. Did I want this job and did I need this out? Fuck yeah, I did. So I worked my ass off. I made my cover letter a Hinge profile so that I would stand out, so that they would actually pay attention to me. I spent weeks making this like application video um having my friends like tell me what i needed to change a million times to make it good and and i convinced them that i could do the job and they hired me amazing it's so cool i love hearing stories of people who go above and beyond to get a job and i'm not going to use the word dream job because i also love that line that you said that i think unfortunately in society we have this concept and i don't know where it comes from But I think people think that there's going to be a dream job out there for them, that they go to school, they study, they work hard. And at the end of this hard work is that career where every day they're going to feel fulfilled. Every day they're going to make the world a better place. They're going to make a shit ton of money. They're going to work with sick coworkers and they're going to live happily ever after. And when we graduate college, and I'm speaking from experience here, Elevation Nation knows this, but Alana, for you, I thought that was my path. Parker thought that was his path. We got great degrees from a Big Ten school. We got jobs in Big Four Consulting doing amazing things. 
And I called him one day and I was like, are you happy, bro? This is hard and this isn't fun. What are we doing? Is this our life for the next 40 years? And we literally had a quarter life crisis freaking out. And I think part of that is rooted in this preconceived notion that everyone has a dream job and we're on a race to find that dream job. And I think fulfillment comes in many different forms and evolves as we're in different stages of our life, very similar to what we need in a partner romantically as we date. It evolves and it changes with you and it grows with you. And so I love what you said on, on the dream job piece. I think that could not be more spot on. Yeah, absolutely. And in terms of like the evolving and growing with you, that also means that at different stages of your life, just because a job was was good for you when you were 22 or 23 doesn't mean that that same type of job is going to be good for you five years later or 10 years later. And it can be really hard when you think something is so right. And then you're like, oh my God, this is so wrong. Or I've outgrown this. That's really hard to admit. Because also by the time we outgrow it, it's usually long into us being unhappy in it, but also feeling like it's all we know. And so then we're afraid to leave. Well, I got to commend you, Alana, because Sam and I talk about something on every episode that we've done with the podcast. You know, we're 140 something episodes in, and that is the concept of mental fortitude. And the way you break down this idea, um, or the way I see it in you, is you had this job, you're like, oh my God, this is going to be amazing. This is what I dream. This is where I'm going. You get the job and you realize, wow, it's completely different than the image that you portrayed in your mind, the image that was portrayed maybe in on TV, in the TV shows you saw, YouTube, whatever, you get there and you're like, wow, this is just not for me. But mental fortitude is all about having the self-awareness to really take a step back and like, is this for me? Like, are my coworkers making me better? Am I fulfilled? Am I happy? Am I miserable? And being real with yourself and aligning that with your vision, like, the vision for what you want in your life. And it seems like you want to be fulfilled doing the things that you love and passion you're passionate about. And then the third piece of mental fortitude is holding yourself accountable, not just waking up and saying something, waking up, saying something, then go doing it. And that's what you did. You quit the job, you applied, you worked your ass off on that application. You got essentially, it seems like the stepping stone to get you where you are today on that path to continue to live your dream and fulfilled life. Totally. And the interesting part is I didn't know that this is where I wanted to end up. I had no idea. I mean, if you would have told me even two years ago, this is what I'd be doing for a living, like or three years ago that I'd be having a dating podcast, like I would have laughed in your face. Like there's no way, you know, that was just so out of the realm of possibility for me. I didn't even know that's what I wanted, but it's what felt right. And it was also a journey that unfolded while I was at Hinge. But I will say like that third part that you mentioned of the mental fortitude of actually doing something about it, that's the part that's the hardest. And that's the part where even if you do have that self-awareness, it can be so scary and so challenging. And that's something that I really struggled with actually when I was at Hinge. I loved my job in, for the first year, year and a half absolutely loved it. And that job went through a lot of changes over time. And, and I changed within it. I grew more than I could ever have imagined through that job and through kind of the way I allowed myself to open up over time. But I realized after a point that I wasn't growing anymore. And I had figured out what I loved to do and I figured that out in that role. At, at one point, I had the opportunity to start a podcast for Hinge. And we did a 12-episode season. It was called Dating Sucks. And it was the first time where I finally was like, oh, my God, this is what I'm actually meant to do. This is me feeling so fulfilled, feeling so passionate about something, seeing it pay off. And, and not just thinking that it's paying off, but knowing that it's paying off. You know, I got into music because I wanted to help people fall in love with music the same way I did, which was by feeling really connected to their favorite bands and singers and musicians. And that wasn't happening. And, but the whole idea behind it was that like, I really wanted to help people find something that helped them or made them feel better, made them feel more understood because that's what music did for me. And when I finally had this podcast, 
I was getting messages every day from people saying that something I said, something I opened up about, which was scary for me to do, but it helped them feel heard. It helped them feel seen or understood. And I was like, oh my God, this is what I need to be doing. And after that first season, you know, we're in the pandemic. Hinge was growing like majorly as a company. I mean, over that year, I think they like quadrupled in in size of employees. And as the company grows, things change. You know, when I got there, it was very much in startup mode. It was like, okay, you're here, go do whatever you want. And by the time, you know, that first season of the podcast had ended, getting that second season renewed, it took six months. And then it still wow. hadn't happened yet because there were so many people who needed to give it the green light, which was so frustrating for me. And I felt like I kind of had to show up to my job every day and like fight to do what I knew was the right thing. So and you're just showing up yeah. every day and it's this podcast. Is that, that it's like what you're that doing or thing. there's one thing. Okay. The, the podcast was one. I, I, so I was running all of Hinge's socials. Um, I was it. running their socials. I was creating video content for them. I was creating memes. I was uh, in the DMs giving people dating advice. I was like part of the marketing team coming up with yeah. like huge ideas and stuff. Um, there was a lot. And then I was like, I want to do a podcast. And then I started the podcast like on top of everything else that I did. Got it. Um, but over time, you know, they hired more people. Everything kind of just became like an uphill battle constantly. So yeah. I, I felt like I every day I was kind of showing up, like trying to convince people like why we need to do the things that we were already doing that were already working. But now there's like new people who have to kind of be bought into it. And it was really hard. So I was, I ended up being really unhappy my last six months there. And I felt really like creatively stunted and really held back. And I knew that I needed to leave. But because I had found that thing that I knew I loved and knew I wanted to do, leaving was really scary. And the idea of leaving was like, well, where am I going to go? You know, there are only like two companies off the top of my head that I could possibly think of that would allow me to do this and like to get a job at Betches or Barstool where they're going to let me have a podcast for them is like a one in a million shot. And then right now, I don't even have the confidence to pitch myself to them. And I felt so down. Like I was not in a good place and it was really hard and I, I didn't know what to do. And I, <laughs> I ended up getting, I ended up losing my job actually, um, which was really shocking, but it was the biggest relief in the world. And wow. I felt so free when that happened. It's sometimes interesting how the universe works out in funny ways that I don't know if I fully believe everything happens for a reason, but I believe things happen and present opportunities for you to take advantage of. And that sounds like the perfect scenario for you of taking advantage of it and learning that you were let go and it was time for you to pivot and do your own thing. And so I want to get into that too, Alana, and hear a little bit of that story as well. You went from having this job that brought you immense fulfillment. You were able to pinpoint the specific activity that gave you that immense fulfillment. And then they pulled the rug out from under you. And to your point, you were left with a few options, right? Try to go to bar stool, uh, maybe go to a competitor, right? A competitor dating app or what you ended up doing, which is building your own empire, as I'm going to call it. How did you take that leap of faith? So as I'm in this video chat, Zoom call where I'm being let go, I like start texting people being like, I'm getting fired right now. Which, oh like, my gosh. Unquote, let go. I call it fired. Quote unquote, let go. I was like, I'm being fired right now. <laughs> I'm starting a podcast. And there I just go. knew instantly, like I didn't have any question about it. I was like, I'm not applying to another job. I don't want to go be a social media manager somewhere. I don't want to be on a marketing team. Like I want to do what I want to do and what I know is going to work. And I know if I go and work at another company, the same thing is going to happen again. And I'm hmm. going to end up feeling held back. I'm not going to feel like I'm doing what I need to be doing. And so I just knew I was like, this is my chance to now do this. And I'm going to give myself like six months and see if I can make it happen. And that's what I did. And I never even like checked in after the six month mark. I was just like doing it. And now it's been almost a year and a half. <laughs> okay. Right. I gotta, I, I gotta hear a little bit more about that because again, like I said, when we started the show, 
whether you know it or not, Parker and I look up to you. We see a similar hopeful journey that you've had that we would like to get to at some point. One, being the face of a organization, a company, a brand is scary. I'm still not good at it. I get very uncomfortable. I think it's very weird. Parker wants me to make all these TikToks with my face in them, talking about my life. And I'm like, bro, I live a boring life. No one wants to see that. So I'm struggling with that. But two, you held yourself accountable with, I'm going to give me six months to try to figure this out because rent in New York is not cheap, right? You had bills to pay. You had things to do. So it's not just, you know, when people say follow your dream or what fulfills you. Yes, I am all for that. But sadly, there are things in life that we need to take care of and there are bills to pay and there are mouths to feed. And so in the back of your mind, you had to have a little bit of some business plan that you were going to execute on, right? Did you work that out in advance or did you figure it out on the fly? I figured it out on the fly. I knew that starting a podcast, building it from the ground up, I knew that that wasn't going to be able to pay my bills for a very long time. You know, I still, I'm actually now almost a year and a half in transitioning into doing it full time. So I knew that while the podcast is what I like, where where my heart was, I knew I was going to have to freelance on the side. And I luckily have all like people know what I do, you know, because I had such like a, an outward facing role because everything I did was on social media. People knew what I did for a living. So when I posted that I was no longer working at Hinge, when I posted even a tweet that I was like looking for freelance opportunities, like people told their people and then people came to me. And so I was in a very fortunate position where it wasn't difficult for me to get clients. Um, That being said, I took on a lot of opportunities that I should not have taken on, that I did not know how to set boundaries with. There were people that I worked with over the last year and a half that I would never recommend that somebody works with them. Like there were a lot a lot of things that I needed to learn that I have learned over the year. And um, it it was definitely a journey. And it was also really difficult for me to balance my time and to learn like, okay, I can only take on X number of clients right now and still have time for the podcast. And that was a really big thing I faced where like I was working more than I ever have worked in order to get everything done. I'm sure you're glad that you learned a lot about the people that you do want to work with and the people that you don't want to work with and how you're going to go about those situations. Right. And now as you transition into going full time, right, you, you're almost having like a, you know, tunnel vision, right. You have a a pretty good sight of where you want to go. Um, but I know we've been talking a lot about, you know, your story, your background, but, you're like the dating and relationship guru. Let's talk dating. Sam wants to know dating stuff. I want to know some relationship stuff. Let's hear your stuff, Alana. Um, so I got, you know, first question to like, I guess, start us out here. As a young adult, right? We got these damn apps, right? And so many people, so many of my friends, Sam included, met their significant other through a dating app. I tell my mom, my dad, you know, like, this is happening. Like, all my friends are meeting on dating apps. Like, and they're like, that is so freaking weird. I mean, is this generation, like, are, is it just changing forever? Like, is it, this is how it's just going to be? I wish I could say I, I had a guess of what's going to happen. You know, even my brother yesterday was like, oh, do you think it's going to be like shot girl summer, hot girl summer, hot back summer again this summer? And I'm like... It's so hard to say where things are going to go because, yes, like we are fully the dating app generation. I mean, significantly more people now meet on dating apps than in person or through friends or any other way. But at the same time, there's also this cultural like, oh, we hate the dating apps mindset, you know, where everybody doesn't want to be on them. They hate how easy it is to get ghosted or how easy it is to feel like there are a million options out there. How do I know who's the right one or you know, there's so many issues that we face with dating apps too, where there, I mean, the more people I talk to, like all of my listeners who reach out to me and, and send me emails and DMs, they're like, I am so burnt out from dating apps. How can I meet people not on the apps? And so it, 
they're a blessing and a curse. I think they are such an incredible tool. I think there are people who are still actually afraid to use them. And, and to those people, I just say, look, it's an amazing gift. It, it's a thing that makes our small world smaller. And I think that anyone who's met somebody on dating apps or who's even had like a positive dating experience would say like, thank God for this app, because this is somebody who fit into my life, who I probably had crossed paths with so many times, but never had the actual opportunity to start a conversation with, to see if we connected on X, Y, Z level. And I mean, that's the situation I'm in with my boyfriend, Jake, who I met on hinge uh, Mm. last January. So, and, and I mean, look, I know how many like incredible stories have come from dating apps and and there are literally millions but at the same time i also know how many people feel so let down and feel so like something's wrong with them because they've been on all the apps they've tried everything they put in the effort and nothing's happened so i ask because i think about you know 20 years ago there were no dating apps and like you know People have been around for thousands and thousands of years, and there's something beautiful about a organic, real, romantic relationship that just begins from seeing someone and talking with them. And our generation, because maybe these apps are helping that or making it more difficult, is like, damn, is that is that hurting our romance in a sense, or is it bringing us closer together? it's doing both at the same time people Hmm. like i said like everyone wants to meet someone in person but people don't go up to people in person you know if you see someone at a bar like unless you have five shots of confidence in you you're just gonna stare at them from afar and be like oh i wish they would come up to me it's like go up to them people don't know how to actually meet someone in person anymore Hmm. that's why our parents that's how it worked right you saw someone you, you like you look you know, you're like attracted to, you're like, all right, I'm going to go shoot my shot and talk to them. And like, my, it was totally my dad normal. saw my mom standing alone at a UJA fundraiser and asked her to dance. And here I am. <laughs> <laughs> it's incredible. So true. Just, like so many thoughts on this, this dating app thing that I think there's like a whole new spectrum of rules and like societal norms that are slowly being built and born due to modern dating. And so Parker, to your question of, is this good? Is this bad? We just did a podcast, a Fortitude and 15 quick podcast that we do every week, Alana, where we talked about our cell phones and how we now use our phones to hide behind for social interactions when we're uncomfortable. And I gave the example of walking on the street and you have those people that are like, Hey, do you have a minute to talk about like the dogs or whatever? And like, you don't, you don't say no, People hide on their phones and just like walk past them, right? So I would say that we unfortunately are now part of a generation that hide behind screens. And so that's inevitable. Dating apps are allowing us to use that hindrance, something that I hate, but it's a reality to our benefit. So I don't know. It's it's interesting. I was talking to my dad about it the other day too, and, and the older generation, you know, my great my grandparents they met because they went to the same college they were both jewish it was the same they graduated the same year and they started a family together right and that was their small circle and my dad's generation they went a little bit further my mom was out of her hometown she was in the big city of chicago and she met my dad at a luggage store that circle got a little bit bigger now our circle's enormous i can set my location to anywhere in the world and meet people and yes that's an advantage but it's also overwhelming like the paradox of choice is insane 100 percent. it makes it really daunting it makes it really scary to pick a person and say like okay maybe this could be my person even if it's going so well you know with somebody on a date it's like well you could continue to swipe and find somebody a little bit better or who checks off one more of your boxes and the same problem happens when you're actually using the app. Like, let's say you spend 10 minutes, let's say you're you're sitting in your bed or you're on the toilet because that's when most people end up swiping anyway. And you swipe and you swipe right on, let's say, 10 people. Let's say five of those turn into a match. Three of those turn into a conversation. 
the conversations are going well. You could be super compatible with all three of them. Maybe your like person is in there. One conversation picks up quicker than the others. You move to text. You plan a date. You kind of forget about the other two because you're now focused on this one. And let's say the date goes well, then you're kind of not going to answer those other two. And then let's say that after the second date, you're like, oh, like, no, it's not right. Or they send you that anti-ghosting text or they don't and they just ghost you. At that point, you feel uncomfortable even responding to the other two because it's been so long. So then you just leave them and maybe they would have been great for you. You know, maybe one of those people, again, could have been your person and you end up going and swiping again and finding the next 10 people to swipe right on who you're going to match with and then have those conversations where some go somewhere and some don't. And I think that's one of the biggest problems is that we're all so busy. We're also have a million things going on. I think that's another thing too, where like you can start a conversation and just not answer and get distracted. And then someone's afraid to follow up when it could have been something. It could have been everything. I think that's an incredible point. I'm fascinated by what scientific studies will come out in like 20 years that tell us all the different ways that this is impacting us. I think if anyone from Hinge or the dating apps are listening, perhaps the Locks Club, which I know, Alana, you are a spokesperson for, and that's where I met my wonderful ex-girlfriend, who's a fantastic person and helped me grow a ton. Uh, we met on there. So maybe there needs to be a feature where you can like rekindle the conversation, right? A restart or a refresh, because I, I totally agree, right? You meet all these people and then the timing might not work. Yeah. Well, the thing is, you could do that at any time. People just think it's weird. People think it, there's like a negative stigma around it. They're like, oh, I'm going to come off desperate. Jake, my boyfriend of almost a year and a half, he messaged, I didn't answer. He messaged me. I didn't answer. A week later, he said, hey, figured I'd try again. And, and talk I, about the Jonas Brothers. See, Jake, yes. I bet you when you sent that message, you didn't know that everyone in the world was going to know exactly what you said. So, <laughs> but we do. Good so job. So true. And and that just goes to show, like, shoot your shot. Send that follow-up message. Like, you have literally nothing to lose and everything to gain. I mean, there was – I love to tell the story. There was this guy I had gone on a date with um, a few years ago, and we had an amazing first date. And I was so sure that I was going to hear from him the next day. I think we both, like – I think he texted me, making sure I got home. I texted him, whatever. And then, you know, neither of us reached back out, like, the next day. And – I was like, no, like that was such a great day. Like, I don't really understand why he didn't follow up. But then like, I didn't really follow up either. And we kind of just let it go. And a few months later, I'm sitting on my best friend's couch and she's like, whatever happened to that guy? And I'm like, I don't know. And she's like, I dare you to text him. I was like, okay. And I literally text this guy. I go four months later, dot, 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 time for a second date. And he responds literally instantly. And he was like, holy shit. Yes. Are you free Wednesday? And I was like, yep. And we get to the date. We're like, this is wild. Like what happened? And we both were like, oh, like we were super into it. Like had such a great time. I like, told everyone how great of a date it was. And then just we let it fade out. And we ended up dating for like six months. Like it was great. And again, like I could have sat there and been like, I don't know what happened. You know, like he never followed up, but I also didn't follow up. And so just me putting myself out there and saying like, I'm going to send this text. Then worst case scenario is that nothing comes from it. And I'm exactly where I was two seconds ago before this conversation happened. I think the worst case scenario in a lot of people's minds is this false reality that if you follow up or check in or double message or whatever, that that person is going to look at their phone, scowl at you, stand up on a table at the bar that they're at and say, look at this loser, Sam Panich, that went to University of Maryland, who's texted me twice. He sucks. No other girl should talk to him. Sam, are, are you talking at ever. a few girls right now? Are you talking <laughs> at a few girls right now who haven't I'm not talking at a few. No, no, are I'm you definitely sure? not. I think it goes both right, ways. Just guys making sure. Just making sure. I'm just saying, I think people in their minds think that they're these social, again, going back to that like playbook, that these norms of like you can't message twice or you can't follow up or people are going to make fun of you. It's like, bro, no one cares. Get, you're not that important. Get over yourself. Just message someone. 100%. So one thing that um, Sam and I talk about a ton and something that I've always tried to bring myself to uh, in work and just life in general is vulnerability. 
I've been out of the dating scene for like four years now. Like I live with my girlfriend. She's amazing. I love her so, so much. Um, and I try to be vulnerable with her pretty often because that I think is really important for a good connection and a good, um, impactful relationship. Um, Alana, I'm curious, what are your thoughts on vulnerability and the power that it can have in the first date? Maybe that first connection that someone can have. I think it's one of the most important things that we can teach ourselves to do. And yes, it's scary, but if you're not vulnerable, if you kind of just go on a first date and do your usual first date stories and not actually dig a little deeper or have at least one conversation that pushes you a little bit out of your comfort zone, you're not fully being yourself. You're not fully showing this person who you are and all the things that make you you. And that's the most important thing you can do on a date is say like, this is me and get a little uncomfortable, be bold, be a little like be your awkward self, be your silly self, whatever it is. But people walk into a first date feeling like, oh my God, I have to impress this person. I have to make them feel so glad that they went on this date, that they gave up this Thursday night, this Saturday night, whatever it is. And God forbid, like they're not into it and they don't want to go on a second date. And, you know, we build up these stories in our heads and we put these people that we're going on dates with on a pedestal before we even meet them. And that puts so much pressure on ourselves to be perfect to be like our coolest, like hottest, most impressive self. And that strips away any opportunity for us to actually feel comfortable and settle in and be vulnerable. I think that's extremely well said. True. Yeah. I mean, that is so spot on. I think it's so fun. Sam, I, talked... I got a question for you. Do oh, you go ahead. now yeah, that sure. you yeah. are, um, now that you are single and you're going around having, you know, dates, you're meeting people, is is that something that you try to um are you trying to be vulnerable on a first date or is it challenging for you? It's a great question. Um I I tend to be fairly vulnerable, I think, for comparing myself to maybe other guys just because I'm so used to now opening up because of this podcast, I think it has helped me realize that it's okay to be vulnerable with who I am. Um, so I do try to bring that to the table because I'm emotional, probably over emotional. I got a lot going on in my, in my dome up here. And if I don't share that with someone probably pretty early on, that might be overwhelming later on. So I want to make sure that someone is okay with that side of me. Cause I think it's what makes me, me. But I do think to Alana's point of impressing people, 100%, I have most certainly tried to do that in my dating life to a fault. Um, and I worked through a lot of that with my therapist today, which we can go into later. It was a great session. Shout out Priscilla, my therapist. She's the homie. Love but, that. And yeah, I, I have a question ahead. for you, not to cut you off, but in what ways, and, and this is a vulnerable question that you're going to have to answer vulnerably, but in what ways on these dates are you being vulnerable? Like, what are the conversations that you're having? What are these vulnerable things that you're pushing yourself to share? It's a great question. I think the one that's most tangible for me um, that has like concrete stories around it to almost like dip my toes in the water of vulnerability is talking about like issues in my family or with health or things like that. That again, it's not like fully going into trauma from your past, but it's talking about things that are close to home, right? Family, things that are personal, maybe some health things that are going on. Uh, unfortunately, it's been a problem in the Panich family the last uh, couple years. And so by opening up and talking about that and showing that I'm comfortable enough with them to share that side of me, that I trust them to hear or listen about what's going on in my life, about your family, that's the most important thing. I think that's how I tend to test the waters. Whether that's a good technique or a bad technique, I have no idea. I'm just being honest that that's kind of the litmus test that I start to see if someone can handle the multiple layers that I have. I think a lot of like one thing that I think about, and you know, I talk with some of my friends who are, you know, dating or going, you know, are single too, is like, they think that, oh, if I over, if I'm over vulnerable, they're going to think like, damn, they're just, these dude, this guy's pouring his heart out to me and I don't even know him. Like that shows something maybe about him. Do you have like a rebuttal to that? 
Yeah, I think that's a really good point. There is definitely a difference between being vulnerable and oversharing. And that's something that a lot of people struggle to find that line. Like, how do you be vulnerable without pouring your heart out, without getting into your trauma and ending up like trauma bonding with people and and just sharing, like dumping on them as if it were a therapy session. I think that's a big issue that people run into where people end up going on dates with someone where it starts as being vulnerable and then it ends up being a therapy session. And I think the way to kind of keep yourself in check with that is to ask yourself, why are you sharing this thing? Are you sharing this thing to let them see this side of you? And to, cause you think like you want them to know about you and about who you are, or are you sharing this thing because you want to talk about it? Because there are a lot of other people that you can talk to about it. You should talk to your therapist. You should talk to your friends, your family, whatever it is. And you shouldn't be like having this long conversation, asking this person for like an hour of their advice. You know, I do think it is kind of interesting to get somebody's perspective and a little bit of advice from them. But I think that like Sam, what you're doing with, with sharing these little bits about what's going on in, in your family and your life and stuff. I think that, like you said, it's a really good temperature check to see if they are able to like feel okay with that. And it also opens the door for them to then be vulnerable back. And I think that's one thing that's uh, like another kind of good way to keep yourself in check with that is by saying like, you're going to share this thing and they're going to listen. And then you're going to be like, what about you? Like what's been going on with you lately? And let them take their turn because you don't want to spend the whole date talking about yourself. You have to remind yourself that you're there on the date to get to know that other person. And you want to be asking them questions, not just giving a monologue the whole time. That is so spot on. And I think Alana, you recently just posted either on Twitter or on Instagram that it's not, you know, whoever you're dating to start their job to fix you. Right. And I love that concept. And I am a hundred percent guilty of thinking that at points in my relationship totally. career, um, because you think, well, this is, this is the person that I'm supposed to trust and they're supposed to help me grow and learn and build and totally agree with all those things. That is great to have a support system in place, but there is, you know, something we talk about on Elevation Nation that I love and I'm very open with is the concept of going to therapy and how I think more young men need to be okay with this concept of working on your brain, right? Like we think it's the coolest freaking thing when you see some big ass dude in the gym ripping curls and like popping a huge bench press. We're like, that guy takes care of himself. And yes, I agree. That's very cool. I think you those guys are cool? sometimes big assholes. Just saying. <laughs> just saying. I'm like, dude, right, you're sorry, taking Parker, up too much How about space running the on the gym? West Side Highway? Someone who's running a marathon like Parker Yablon, also very cool. You're taking care of your body. But I would say <laughs> taking care of and working on your mental state with therapy or coaching or introspection or reflection, whatever it may be, is equally as important. And so I think that's kind of where hopefully we can change the narrative for young men to realize that that's something that they can and should be doing. I, can you hear me? Yes. Sorry, my AirPods just tried to take a call from my mom, so I haven't <laughs> heard funny. anything. That's funny. My mom just called me as well. Can't yet, um, and I don't know how to make it come back. Give me one second. That's okay. Take your time. I'm on Do Not Disturb, so that should not have happened. Mom, I'm in the middle of a podcast. God. Hold on. What the heck? I don't even know where it's coming from. Um, I literally hear nothing right now. Let me disconnect and reconnect. Okay, we're back. Sorry about Let's that. Do. That's okay. Um, Parker's very good at editing. You're fine. Um, I was talking about how we're trying to change the narrative for yeah. young adults and especially men to be okay with working on your mental state. It doesn't mean you have to go to a therapist and go full out, but... Doing, uh, you know, reflective and introspective work is really important. 100%. You know, I think that guys think that if if a girl hears that they're in therapy, they're going to think like, oh, there's something wrong with him or, oh, like he's weak. He doesn't have his shit together. Like, no, guys, if you're listening, like girls think that a guy who goes to therapy is the hottest thing ever. Like I would rather be dating somebody who goes to therapy than be dating somebody who has a six pack. One million 
gajillion percent. Knowing somebody has worked on themselves or is actively trying to work on themselves, not only does that say so much about them, but that says so much about how they're going to show up for you in a relationship, how they're going to be as a partner, how they're going to be willing to work through things together rather than just going and blowing off steam at the gym or whatever else it may be, which of course, like, yeah, be healthy with your body too. But no, I think 100%, I think therapy is such an amazing tool. I think it's 2022, like there doesn't need to be this stigma around it anymore. And I get it. Like it can be scary to start therapy, especially if you've never ever done it before. You know, you've just heard about it and it's scary. It's like, how do you find the right therapist? How do you start? Like, what do you talk about? Like, ask around, ask your friends for recommendations, look online, if there are any like people you follow online that you know they talk about therapy, see where they go, get recommendations, and then your therapist will like guide you through the rest of it. And it's really not as scary as it seems. Like it's such an amazing thing. And you don't have to be broken, depressed, anxious, or any like that. You could be perfectly doing all right. And therapy still, I think, personally, a really good idea. Because you can talk to someone who has no bias about you in any way, shape, or form, and they'll listen to you. And they'll give you feedback. And it'll make you better on your first dates because then you won't be spending your first date like venting about all the shit going on in your life because you're already going to have done that with your therapist. And then you can get there to know you your go. date instead. And they can get to know <laughs> like all the great parts about you. When I showed up for my first therapy session, again, I did it because one, shout out to Parker and I's employer because it's free. So thank you for that. Mental health is important. Um, so I was like, all right, whatever. I'll try this. Like I'm starting a podcast around your mindset. I should probably see what this is all about. And so I get on the call and I'm like, hi, it's so nice to meet you. Um, you know, I, I really don't think I have anything wrong with me. I just wanted to see what this was about. So yeah. And she's like, okay, so tell me about yourself. And I was like, yeah, again, like there's nothing wrong with me. And then I talked for 45 minutes straight and realized how much shit I needed to unpack in my life. And she's like, you still don't think you have anything to talk about? And I was like, I'll see you next week. So it's okay if you don't know where to start to a honest point, you will be guided through it. And it's fantastic. 100%. I also like, I started therapy when I was fully at rock bottom, like every single part of my life was a disaster. I like couldn't go to work. I was so depressed and like I had never been depressed before. I had never experienced anxiety until this situation that I can't get into right now because it would I would talk for three hours about it um, until this all happened. And I started therapy in a time where I felt really broken. And I a lot of it was my dating life. A lot of it was my career. It was when I was like feeling really terrible about music um, and all that. But those therapy sessions were so different than the ones I'm in now where I recently started with a new therapist and most of my therapy sessions for a few years straight were like about my dating life being a complete disaster and about my career being a feeling like a complete disaster. And now my therapist literally has not heard about my boyfriend. Like, We've had sessions for like two months now and we have not talked about my relationship. She knows nothing about me and Jake because there are so many other parts of my life that I just never actually like worked through in therapy or talked through. And because I was so focused on like the dating stuff and it's really nice to now kind of be starting fresh and in a completely different mindset. And we can actually just like talk about me and the different things that I've experienced that I've never really like thought about. So yeah, to your point, Sam, I think there's so much like, even if you think there's nothing wrong with you, there doesn't have to be anything wrong with you. There's still just things that you should talk about because they've happened to you and life is really hard. And I just want to say back to my point about vulnerability. If you have a significant other as well in your life, being vulnerable with them is super important. And I just say kudos to JJ for always listening to my problems on top of my therapy sessions. And you know what? That's free therapy, but that's also love, right? That is, that is love. That's true love to love you, Parker. You are quite the amazing, unique individual and we absolutely love JJ. So we've been talking for almost an hour. Alana, I recognize that you have companies to run and things to do. So we wanna make sure we wrap up at a reasonable hour. I don't want to. So we're going to move on. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> we said that you have a three-hour story, so we might have to run this back in a few months if you're down. Um, Obviously. Okay, let's do it. 
All right, rapid fire questions for you. Here we go. First thing that comes to your mind, quick answers. We didn't prep Alana on these, so get ready. First one, favorite first date spot activity. Ooh, that's really hard. Why is that hard? Like what's like, what's like a cool, creative, unique first date spot that you would recommend? Not like a spot. Like I'm not saying like a bar in, in New York, but like what should you do? Yeah. I really like, and this is something that became popular during quarantine and the pandemic, but I really like like the grabbing the to-go drinks and going for a walk, whether it's on the West mm. Side Highway or around Central Park or around the East Village and stopping and grabbing drinks at different spots. Like, I think that's great. I think it gives you a lot of different things to talk about, to kind of see together. You can people watch. You can focus on whatever like weird shit happens in whatever city you're in um, or talk about like, oh, I went to that restaurant one time. You know, it, it takes the pressure off and it's really nice and relaxing and enjoyable all right next one what is the most romantic city in the world and why oh i think the obvious answer that people would say is paris but i don't think that's true i think the most romantic city is the city in which you fall in love with somebody and Good experience answer. those things with them. Love that. That was, that was beautiful. Oh, thanks. All right. Next question. And I'm sure you've talked about this on the podcast and it might take a little while, but your worst date story. We'd like to hear <laughs> it if you're comfortable sharing. Oh my God. Of course. So I always, <laughs> Jake, my boyfriend kind of called me out because I've always said like, I don't have like any terrible date stories, but I recently shared something on a podcast episode and he was like, Lana, that's obviously your worst date story. How have you not talked about that before? What do you mean? Um, it was during COVID and I had hit it off with this guy over text. I was like super into him. We had mutual friends who said he was great. Um, so I ended up going to his apartment for a first date because it was COVID and it was raining and I felt safe doing that because again, mutual friends like confirmed that he wasn't a serial killer. And so I get to his apartment and the first thing we do is like order food. We order Italian food and then we go and sit on his couch and he like pours a glass of wine. And he's like, do you want to like, like we start, he like brought up like a show that he had been watching and asked like what shows I was watching. He was like, oh, like you have to try the show. Do you want to put on an episode of it while we wait for our food? And I was like, okay. Like figuring it would kind of just be like background noise while we like talked and stuff. And it was some like 22 minute sitcom, a Netflix original or something. I don't remember what it was called. But no, it wasn't background noise. We were like fully watching this show and I'd like try and like start a conversation, get like one word answers back. And I'm like, okay, like I guess we're, he's really into the show that like, he's already seen. We'll talk after the uh, show ends, after the episode ends. So the episode's ending and it's like the like next episode thing starts to load and I'm waiting for him to like let it, to like cancel it. Nope, he lets it go. Second episode starts. I'm like, uh-oh. Like, wait, what, what's happening? Our food comes. He pauses it for a minute. We, like, get our food stuff together. I, like, ask him another question. He starts playing the show again. And, like, at the towards the end of the second episode, I'm like, okay, there's no way this guy... This, is, this guy was, like, four years older than me. He's, like, in his early 30s. Like, you, you would think he knows what a first date is. You guys, we watched six episodes of this show. Oh, no. Six. I can just like picture like how just to cringe. <laughs> I'm, un I'm I... uncomfortable and I'm not yeah. even there. Oh, geez. And was he like I... nervous? Was he just I... not about it? Oh, man. I don't know. You know, at the end, he walked me to his elevator, said he had a really great time, like gave me a kiss, said he'd love to see me again. And I, I've never been more confused. And I... I've never also left a date knowing less about a person. Like, I think I knew less about him leaving than I did when I came in. You knew more about the uh, show. You Now you oh, can tell us yeah. all about the sitcom. So Totally. Though I don't even remember the name of it because I was so <laughs> focused on, like, what the hell is happening on this date? What is going on? I'm just picturing, so. like, Alana, like, out of the corner of her eye, just, like, glancing at this dude being like, when is he going to stop watching this show? This is a prank. Or it was yeah, really right? weird. It was so bizarre. We did not have a second date. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Good. Fair enough. <laughs> All right. Next question. I know we got two more. It's a tough one. It, it, it's a challenging one. I just want to say. 
I'm you know scared. that song written by Hadaway? Lana, what is love? What is love? See, yeah, I, yeah. That's exactly. why I'm not a singer. Baby, don't hurt me. Um, oh, you got it. <laughs> I'll get up and start dancing and, you know. It's a great um, song. It really it is. It is a great song. So I think love is when you equally care about somebody else's happiness and their passions and their like well-being like as much almost like if sometimes even more than you do about your own like for me if jake is having a bad day like i'm having a bad day you know like his wins are my wins his losses are my losses and and vice versa and i i think love is like really having that care for somebody else and and wanting them to succeed and wanting their happiness as much as you want your own. That was beautiful. I think that's absolutely spot on. We can all be so lucky to find that in our lives, hopefully. So, all right, another rapid fire. I don't know if you ever listened to NPR, um, Guy Raz, How I Built This. It's an entrepreneurship podcast, but it's one of our favorites. And they ask a question about... You know, the success of the entrepreneur, how much was luck and how much was hard work or effort. So I want to ask you the same about finding your person. How much is luck and how much of it is effort? I think putting in the effort will give you the opportunity to have luck. If you don't put in the effort, the right person isn't just going to show up at your door one day. You have to be putting yourself out there. Is it a numbers game? I don't know. Some people will say yes. Some people will say no. I think that if you're putting yourself out there and if you're showing up to your dates as your best self and and with the right attitude, I think that you will get lucky and that person will at some point present themselves to you. And again, you have to be putting in the effort to also realize when there's somebody great in front of you and realize when there's not. I kind of didn't answer the question, but I thought it was oh, good. Well. No, I liked. Okay. I actually really yeah. liked what you said. I've actually heard it on Guy Raz's podcast a similar answer, just you know, with starting a business. But you know, two very. So different I should things. go on that podcast next. You you can recommend me as guest. Oh my god! If you're on that podcast, you're doing something really right. I'm just saying. Someday. Uh, yeah, someday. Well, Alana, it comes down to the last question of the episode. And we ask every guest who comes on Elevation Nation this question to share with Elevation Nation the motto, the quote, the phrase, the slogan that you live your life by. So Sam and I have been waiting. We're really curious. Alana, what's your mental motto? My mental motto is something I learned from my mom, and it has fully gotten me everywhere in life, every job, every quote unquote lucky situation, they, those things weren't luck. Um, it's, if you don't ask, you don't get. And that goes from when I, it started with, I wasn't accepted to Newhouse at Syracuse off the bat. And I didn't want to go to Syracuse unless I was in Newhouse. And my mom said, if you don't ask, you don't get. And on accepted students day, she made me walk right into admissions and say, you guys made a mistake and I should be accepted into the school. And I basically like reapplied to new house and sent some more stuff. And about a month later, I got an email like, you were right. Congratulations. Welcome. Um, and every internship if that I got, I, I didn't have any connections. My parents didn't have any connections. I reached out to people on LinkedIn. I asked people to connect me with XYZ person that they were connected with. When I was there, I like, you know, at one of my internships, I heard that the team was going to Coachella. I was like, oh my God, this would be a dream. And so I went to my boss and I was like, if you need an extra hand at Coachella, like I'd love to help. And he was like, oh my God, that would be incredible. Like, thank you so much for offering. Please come. But I wouldn't have gone to Coachella had I not asked. And suddenly I'm there with like a VIP and artist pass. And so it really, really took me through everything and and completely relates to my dating life too and so that's definitely something that i i mean thank you barbara for teaching me that but i definitely recommend that everybody takes that one into their repertoire 
Shout out Barbara for a beautiful mental motto passed down to your daughter. That's incredible. It's so fun for Parker and I to hear everyone's different mental mottos of how they're trying to live their life. So Alana, we haven't had any for- duplicates yet. Yeah, exactly. No one said we the same last duplicate. Been cool. So, yeah. well, you guys better prepare for when you're on seeing other people. The question I'll ask you is what's the best piece of dating advice you've ever gotten? It's funny because I'm probably going to say something that you told me on this show, but we'll we'll save that for then. So, all right, Alana, this was incredible. Thank you so much, seriously, for hanging out with Parker and I uh, tonight. We learned a ton about you and your story, um, but more importantly, I think we hit on the importance of being vulnerable, uh, how it's okay to go to the therapy, and how working on yourself can help you find love, which is, I think, what all of us are looking for. So you are incredible. We are so glad that you are part of the nation now. Welcome to the fam. We're so glad you were here. And seriously, thank you from the bottom of our hearts. This is awesome. Thank you for having me. I like. I feel great right now. I'm so excited. I really appreciate you guys having me on. I absolutely love what you guys are doing, and you're amazing at it. So thank you for including me on your journey. I just want to say, Alana, it's so freaking cool just seeing a young adult in their 20s absolutely crushing it and doing what you're passionate about and not letting anything get in the way you're asking you're going you're moving you're pushing to your own beat and that's something that sam and i try to do every day and i think that is what elevating is all about is that you put on those blinders you have a little bit of mental fortitude and you just go so it's just cool to meet another person absolutely crushing it and uh can't thank you enough. Ooh, thanks. All right, All right Sammy. Elevation Nation. Until next week. Peace. Peace.